Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the very outset, I wish to accept my deepest sympathy to the bereaved families and their close ones affected by the pandemic virus. And I have a special thought for my ex-friend colleague, Dr. Bruno Chong, who passed away in the line of duty. We pray to God that all those who succumbed during the pandemic may their soul rest in peace. The repealing of the Quarantine Act, which dated back to 1954, has surely done its test of time and reinforces an overdue response to recent large outbreak of Ebola virus disease, followed by that of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, both quarantinable diseases. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is my opinion that any amendments to the previous Quarantine Act should have been brought in March, while for the last two weeks, Government figures show that there is not a single new case, and as per government statistics, it appears that the peak of the epidemic in Mauritius is behind us. And let's hope that we do not get afflicted by a second wave of resurgence. Nevertheless, the aim of the proposed quarantine bill is, I am sure, to have as its foremost priorities its ability to prevent the introduction the transmission and the spread of communicable diseases in the Republic of Mauritius, and to provide greater transparency regarding its response capabilities and practices. The quarantine bill must be implemented within part of an accepted comprehensive package of public response and containment measures. And in this context, the powers conferred to the Prime Minister, the Minister of Health, the Quarantine Authority, and the police as enacted in the bill must be fully respectful of the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of people during its implementation. Mr. Speaker, sir, I will now comment on a few aspects of the quarantine bill particularly. <laughs> With regards to clause two, the exhaustive list of communicable diseases thereby listed include among others, botulism, and I therefore believe Diseases such as hepatitis A and B, HIV, and sexually transmitted disorders should also be part of that list as they too can be acquired through personal contact. The proposed amendment at close free with regard to absolute power of lockdown and shutdown is a concern because that justification will be based on the schedule, section two, whereby certain medical conditions that are more exclu exclusively quarantinable diseases, communicable diseases, for example, botulism, be used as reasonable grounds to apply Section 3. There should be cross-scientific medical board chaired by the chief medical officer and the director of medical services, hereafter known as the quarantine officer, that recommends to the prime minister of such heightened risk of epidemic with regards to any communicable disease as per Schedule 2. The unfortunate fate of stranded Mauritians to return to Mauritius can thus only be decided by the Prime Minister, who has the absolute power of quarantine as per entry of aircraft and ship into the Republic. I therefore request that such decision goes in line with Article 15 of the Constitution, which provides the protection of freedom of movement and ensures swift and diligent return of our compatriots, irrespective of financial costs. I do appreciate the efforts made by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in this matter. And there's a section clause three, proper communication must be engaged to reduce panic and improve compliance. The commissioner of police who is empowered to issue work access permit or permit, who is or permit for any outdoor purpose has to be appreciative of the importance of staff working in essential services, frontliners, so that proper instruction be given along the line of command to avoid undue arguments, confrontation, timeless explanation between law enforcers and bona fide members of the public who've got a pass. We must not have uncalled circumstances where recently duty-bound layers needed to have recourse to the Supreme Court to convince the authority of their need to circulate in order to attend their respective clients. Mr. Speaker, sir, as to close four with regard to the likelihood of an epidemic or pandemic, the decision to prevent the introduction and spread of a communicable disease in Mauritius must not be solely based 
on the decision of the Minister of Health, but rather be supported by clinical, medical, and laboratory evidence of the infectious disease together with the approval of the World Health Organization. This will inspire more confidence from the population at large. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, the designation of quarantine facility must provide clear, up-to-date, transparent, and consistent truthful information about quarantine measures and constructive engagement within communities is essential if quarantine facilities and measures are to be accepted by the population at large. The sad and regrettable incident that occurred at the Katsur Refuge Center on the 6th of March 2020 is a clear example of poor preparedness and communication and engagement with the communities before the conversion of the said center into a provisional quarantine facility and such incident should not repeat itself. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to clause five of subsection one, in particular as to the designation of a quarantine facility, the World Health Organization on the first 31st of January declared the outbreak of COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. And preparedness was to mean that we did not have to wait for the declaration of a pandemic. This was the first forward warning that the WHO had given to all countries who have a WHO director located on site. As from then, one of the primary concerns was to ensure that facilities of quarantine were adequately prepared and consideration be given for setting up a further quarantine facility in the country, since it was well known that the Suyak facility at the time would be insufficient in capacity. It is the duty of government and the Ministry of Health to ensure proper isolation facilities and medical care once quarantine is to be ordered. Isolation facilities must have proper medical and protective equipment and staff by high level multidisciplinary team on site having wide experience and sub-specialized training in running intensive care units and isolation units. Such level of staffing will undoubtedly positively affect our level of mortality and morbidity rates of those admitted likewise in Suyak Hospital, which when we compare the figures to our neighboring countries, Reunion Island, Seychelles, Madagascar, ours was too high. We do not even figure among Africa's 10 best as pointed out by the leader of the position. I've just listened to Honorable Dulab comparing our figures and our statistics with the number of deaths lying in America, European countries, and he'll also mention about deaths lying in the corridor, which we have not seen here. Let's, go, let's pray to God that we did not have it, but when we are going to compare, we should compare ourselves with countries that are islanders and lying next door to us, having the same demography and the geographical status, then we can compare like with likes. Such level of having 10 deaths so far due to COVID-19 tests must not be something to be proud, nor to be pompous and inconsiderate as per Honorable Jagatwal comment yesterday. I strongly advise him as a friend and as a colleague and as an honorable member to express regret and remorse because one death is just too many. He should have the minister in charge tries to work out why our next door neighbor had no deaths and do not use our high prevalence of non-communicable diseases as a shield, but rather to look at our specialized staffing where we need subspecialists in the field of intensive care. I mean, we need to have intensivists running intensive care when we have patients who are on long-term, what we call intubation. Intensivists means specialists in intensive care for those who are not too medically oriented. <laughs> Did we have any intensivists at Suyak or ENT? Worse, when I personally proposed the help of trained intensivists and other private senior specialists to help on two occasions, one through a correspondent to the Prime Minister's office and second to a senior advisor to the PMO, there was no follow-up. Mr. Speaker, sir, 
a multidisciplinary team of medical specialists, together with paramedics, including staff, nurses, and pharmacists, need to be assigned to every quarantine centers. And public health specialists are required for monitoring of public health aspects of the facility routinely. The early and orderly availability of protective equipment will surely avoid the embarrassing situation of shortage and supply of protective equipment, masks and PPEs, witnessed during the early phase of the pandemic due to delayed preparedness. My visit together with the leader of the operation at Suya Hospital on the 31st of January is testimony to what I'm talking today. While the government already had a strategic dissemination plan sent to them by the WHO through their direct directors who are based in Mauritius. The Honorable Minister of Health himself confirmed we had only 8,000 masks in his answer to a PNQ on the 3rd of February this year for a population of 1.2 million and arrangements were then being made to order, order for more. And as a recent, re recent written reply to Honorable Juman, only 3,000 PCR re reverse transistors tests were ordered on the 13th of March, which were delivered on the 24th, and with more orders than arranged for the 19th of March. If unfortunately we were to face a resurgence of the disease or a wave of new quarantine disease, then it is important that we have advanced preparedness planning and availability of resources. In line with Clause 5, the setting up of quarantine facilities must be seen that, among others, that the following are strictly adhered to. The provision of medical tests and kits and that they are carried out by trained healthcare personnel with proper protective equipment so that the testing procedure is not a feared process. This will avoid the numerous rumors suggesting that the swab tests were carried out by the resident upon themselves present due to the fearful factor of some staff having no protection at all. Such an approach will ensure the quality of testing that will have a bearing on the result. The designation of a quarantine officer who will be in charge of the quarantine facility is crucial to the proper running and efficient discharge of services the facility is catered for. Such medical practitioner, as proposed, have to have the utmost professionalism and integrity so as to maintain the rules and regulations that are really important in quarantine facility particularly the welfare of the residents, that the clinical care of those in this facility are not substandard and maintain strict control on entry and departure from the facility. Concerning the entry and departure from this facility, as mentioned in section eight of the bill, it is the duty of the quarantine officer, I mentioned rightly, that his authorization prevails at all times. The outcry following the visit of VIPs and ministers at Katsua Refuge Center on the 17th of March without wearing appropriate protecting gear. And I quote, somebody mentioned equipment. We're talking here about protective gear. On that day, while visiting approximately 25 Mauritians who were originally placed there is highly justified that the outbreak called for. Such action did put at great risk of contagion the VIPs themselves, particularly our prime minister, our Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Health and MPs of the constituency, the patients and all those who were there, despite knowing fully well that we were already in a pandemic. It was indeed a very irresponsible and reckless decision by whoever was in charge not to at least press upon those present to wear the protective gear. I wish to remind the House that in reply to a PNQ from the leader of the opposition on the 3rd of February, the Minister of Health stated forcefully that no other protective gear should be worn except the mask, and not even that was applied during their visit to the Katsur Refuge Center. The point is that nobody is above the law, and when it comes to strict regulation of quarantine facility, and the quarantine officer must at all times uphold conditions attached to a quarantine facility. Also, I noted that no provisions have been made with regard to facilities for pregnant women, neonates, or young children below the age of 12, and psychiatric patients within quarantine facility. This group of patients surely 
necessitate more than the basic facilities and support present in normal quarantine. I believe exceptions need to be addressed in the enactment of the bill. While the quarantine officer who is in charge of coordination and supervision of quarantine center, it is also mentioned that a quarantine person may make a request to, make, to follow medical treatment in a private health institution at his own cost. However, I shall be grateful to know whether the resident may request a private medical practitioner to attend to him who is not the quarantine officer nor his assistant in the quarantine facility itself. It would be more fitting that the assessment of private health institutions be made not only by the quarantine officer, but together with a specialist in infectious disease and internal medicine to ensure evidence-based medical treatment. Moving to section nine, the duty to provide information, I regret to say that there is no mention in the bill as to data protection of those in quarantine. With regard to their personal travel history, their medical conditions, the results of any specific test with regard to the contagion, and any other test that may be deemed fit at the time, and I hope that the move of the bill will bring amen too. I'm now moved to the very sensible clause 11, which has caused a lot of uh, concerns, be it on social media, in the newspaper, from social groups and civil liberty groups. The unilateral right to arrest without warrant if the police feels that there has been a breach of curfew regulation and to enter premises without warrants need to have safeguards to avoid abuse of power. The power conferred to the police officers in the bill to arrest without warrant is frightening as it appears that it will depend on his own judgment of what is reasonable cause at the time. Restrictions of rights can be justified on medical evidence with limited duration but in line with the government ratification of the International Convention of Human Rights. As Honorable Yutim pointed out yesterday, that exercise to arrest should come from higher ranking police officers. I strongly request that this clause be reviewed. There's a check and balance between arbitrary arrest and the need for the right to health and respect Article 9 of the Constitution on the, protect, on the protection of privacy, home, and other property and that if individual felt to have breached regulation, to at least be given 72 hours to attend a police station accompanied by counsel to represent them. This particular clause can lead to arbitrary arrests of citizens by a small minority of police officers who either have an excess of zeal or who have been instructed by higher ranking officers or masters of the day. I am worried for the people out there are just being suspectedly unwell, or sick, or contagious, can be in the future a reasonable excuse or ground for criminal offense or settlement of scores. Much has been said about various clauses of the COVID-19 miscellaneous bill and its implication. I just want to mention that any amendment to the Pharmacy Act takes into consideration that the pharmaceutical products produced by a new company must either be federal FDA approved or have had WHO recognized accredited quality control since the safety, quality, and efficacy are paramount with regards to patient usage. Proper validation of the setting of the manufacturing plant in terms of equipment, installation, operational, and performance must be in conformity with international standards. There is no need for amendments for such a fast track approach in this COVID-19 miscellaneous bill. I fail to see the need for such an emergency amendment at present. It looks like those of have been taking uh, leasing facilities from leasing companies seem to have been forwarded in the enact enactment of the bill. I make a strong appeal to the Ministry of Financial Services and Good Governance with regard to small SMEs and individuals who have opted leasing facilities are now having huge difficulties with regards to payments. I have not so far come across any amendment that can, at the very least, allow a moratorium for at least six months until business activities regain its momentum. Finally, on a global note, and considering the very complex legal amendments and implications of the COVID-19 bill, I make it strongly on behalf of healthcare personnel, police officers, and frontliners that much more encouragement be given to them as they have exposed themselves 
themselves, work odd hours, some round the clock, and in so doing, putting their families and themselves at risk. Words will never be enough to salute their dedication and commitment, be it for those who work in the CB to provide their sewage lights, the Central Water Authority to ensure continuous running water, refute collectors ensuring our surroundings are kept clean, supermarket staff, frontliners, personnel, port and airport staff. It is therefore unacceptable that certain employers are proposing to redeem services again already done during the crisis in lieu of vacation leave or holiday time off. The law must ensure and guarantee all payments over time and extra duty for those who work in the essential services mentioned above during the crisis, and likewise ensure that certain FATCA directors do not perceive dividends for this financial year and profit be redistributed to employees who have accepted a shortfall in their salaries during the moment of crisis. Big companies making million rupees of profits do not go in the right overnight and should not be expected to be the recipient of hefty rescue packages. While the move to bring amendments to the law and quarantine bill is welcome, however, assurances are needed that the measures will only apply to fight the viral pandemic and concerns arise from all quarters of society as to powers conferred in the act which could in different circumstances be used in malicious fashion. I would strongly recommend a sunset clause for some of the sections of the bill to automatically expire. The potential trade-off between government interactions and individual rights and freedom during times of emergency is surely a matter of opinion. However, it is the long-term implication and impacts of law adopted in response to emergencies that raise additional and arguably greater concern. I quote Alan Green, a law specialist in constitutional law and human rights. History has shown that emergency powers often outlive the phenomenon that triggers the introduction of emergency powers in the first place. While the need for exceptional powers may be obvious at the outset of an emergency, assessment of these powers when they are no longer needed is considerably more problematic. Therefore, amendments and concerns must not fall on deaf ears and must call for our inborn patriotism to protect individual rights. I sincerely hope that my concerns and amendments be considered in the enactment of the final version of the bill that will aid public health responsiveness to outbreak of new or re-emerging communicable disease. Thank you.